Hello, welcome back to another episode of From Prison to the Streets. I'm Eric. I did 11 years in prison and I talk about prison stuff. Today we are continuing my story through the prison system. In my last video where I was talking about this kind of stuff, I told you about how I was in SEG for a long time and then they were going to move me to the mental health unit because I wasn't eating. I lost a bunch of weight and all that good stuff. So that's what we're talking about today. Before we get into the video, I want to apologize in advance. I talk a lot with my hands and my hands look real grimy because I've been out peeling walnuts. It is walnut picking season here in Kansas. So if you guys have ever done that, you already know you peel walnuts and uh, the outer coating before you get to the shell is like a rind and it has this acid or some sort of liquid in there that will stain up your hands and stuff real bad. So that's why my hands look real grimy. But without further ado, let's talk about this. Let me begin by talking about what the mental health unit is so you guys have a kind of a good idea of what I'm talking about here. In Lansing, you have two mental health units. You have True One and True Two. True One is for guys that kind of need a little bit of help to do their day-to-day -day activities for the most part, guys who have pretty severe mental illnesses and stuff and they aren't as high functioning as other people who are in the mental health unit. True two is for people with like um, bipolar disorder, or PTSD, uh, schizophrenia, but people who can function, you know, people who can go about their day to day activities with less help. True two is also used as a transitional mental health unit. And that's a weird word. And I'll try to explain what that means. True means treatment and reintegration unit. And a lot of states have some sort of program that you have to take when you get out of Supermax or long-term segregation. El Dorado also had a program for Supermax. It was the BMP program. That's what they called it there, the Behavior Modification Program. You have guys that are in SEG for all sorts of reasons. It might be CBB, uh, constant bad behavior. They might be OSR under investigation. They might have an STG thing pending, you know, a security threat group, or they might have stabbed someone or, you know, committed a pretty violent assault. There's all sorts of reasons why people could be in the hole. But after you're in the hole for a while, your mind starts to change. And so a lot of prisons have some sort of program that you have to take when you go from long term segregation out to gen pop because the transition is a little bit difficult and a lot of guys who do a lot of time in the hole will sabotage themselves intentionally so they can go back to the hole because it's just easier. You get accustomed to not having another person in your cell. You get accustomed to having food delivered to you. You get accustomed to not having physical contact. And then when you're just thrown out into a crowded place like the chow hall or something like that, it can be kind of overwhelming. You get panic attacks and things like that. Not everybody does. Some people do better in the hole than others. That said, I think if you do a lot of time in the hole, no matter who you are, it's going to change you some way in your mind. I knew one guy who did so much time in the hole. He was super max for eight years. So 23 hours a day, locked down. And after eight years, he was kicked out to Gen Pop. He was on death row. And when he was kicked out to Gen Pop, after he his sentence was um, commuted, I guess, to life without parole. He didn't know how to function. You know, he <laughs> his door would be open and he would just stand at the door and look out as if he was still in SIG. It was weird. Anyway, so the true unit is a transitional housing unit as well as just a mental health unit. So there's a lot of guys who are in true to that just spend a lot of time in super max or long term segregation. And they're making that transition from a segregation setting to gen pop. They have to complete the program and then out they go. Uh, for people who are involved in gang stuff, they have to go through the gang program and it's kind of similar. In order to be in true to you have to be on medication. You have to have a mental health diagnosis, which I was diagnosed with PTSD and depression and anxiety and some other stuff. But that's where I was at. True One used to be what was called the A&T building, the Adjustment and Treatment building. It was built in the 1960s. It was the old segregation unit, you know, the old hole back in the day. They moved that over to C-Cell House and A-1 Cell House. 
B cell house is mostly true two, and then the true unit is true one. So I packed all my stuff in the hole. They took my boxes down to true two. I was on the flag, which means the bottom run. And, you know, it was pretty cool. Immediately, I got moved back in next to uh, JR. JR ended up going to True 2 as well. Eventually, they were going to release him from the hole, but he had to go through the program like everybody else. He had bipolar disorder, and so that's what he was doing. Now, it was cool to see JR because... You know, we had talked a lot while we were in the hole. It was cool to have a familiar face down there. There were a few other familiar faces, too. Not necessarily people that I cared a lot for or that I I really messed with, but it was cool to have some familiar faces around people that I'd known for years. On account of that, when I got down there, people were automatically hollering at me there, hey, you need some coffee, I'll throw you some coffee. Hey, you need some soups, I'll throw you some soups, which I didn't need that stuff, but it was cool to know people had my back. True was a little bit different from SEG. It was a lot like SEG, and you had a little bit more freedom. So unlike SEG, we didn't have to go to the showers in handcuffs. We didn't have to go to a dog cage when we went to yard. It was similar to SEG in the sense that you were locked up most of the time. But it was different from SEG in the sense that you weren't really a segregation inmate. You know, you could go and and take your showers regularly. You could go and get ice regularly. You could be out and about, go to yard, whatever, go to chow. That was cool. You know, that was nice to have that little bit of freedom. And we also had to go to our mental health programs during the day. And depending on what you were being treated for, you would have different mental health treatment programs. I was in DBT, Dialectical Behavioral Therapy. I was also going through EMDR, uh, which is a great type of therapy for uh, PTSD. If any of you out there struggle with PTSD or have been diagnosed with it, if you've tried everything else, I would suggest EMDR because it actually works. It, It worked for me anyway. In addition to having a little bit more freedom, I also got all my property back. Not being a segregation inmate, we could have property. So you know, I got a bunch of my my property back. I had my hobby craft stuff. I could, make, you know, make my jewelry and stuff again. That was cool. That was nice. One of the mental health programs that they had there was music therapy. And the activity specialist over the music therapy program, he discovered that I could play the guitar really well. And well, I say really well, but there's a lot of people out there who can play better than me by far. Anyway. He saw that I could play the guitar. He discovered that I taught the music class while I was in El Dorado for a long time. And so he had me teaching music classes for True One and True Two. That was really, really rewarding because I got to work with guys who had, you know, serious mental disabilities, psychological disabilities. And for them to get out of their cell and do something and kind of break out of their box a little bit and interact, that was really cool. And you know, that was probably the best part about being in the mental health unit, honestly. We also did two live concerts, I believe. I believe it was two, maybe it was three. Actually, it was it was more than that because we did several concerts the second time around. We did a concert for True One, we did a concert just for True Two, and then we did a concert for staff. So we did I think a total of four concerts while I was in the in the treatment unit. That was really cool because nobody had a guitar player to play their sets. They were just kind of doing karaoke stuff and then they discovered that they had a guitar player and we had another guy, a guy named Jimmy, playing the bass and a guy playing the drums and we just kind of threw on a jam session. It was really cool. And it was all different types of music. We had people doing rock. We had people doing country. I was doing metal, of course. We had dudes doing rap. And I played on almost everybody's set. And it pushed me outside of my box because I like metal, you know. It was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. And when all was said and done, we got a lot of compliments from staff and stuff like that. And... It felt good, but I got better. You know, I started putting on weight. 
I started dealing with some stuff that I hadn't thought about in ages. You know, I talked a little bit about my childhood on this channel before. And I started kind of going through some of that stuff and, and trying to deal with it. And that was helpful and challenging. I don't like reliving a lot of that stuff. I don't like thinking about it. And it's probably more beneficial to confront it and deal with it than stuff it away somewhere where I don't have to encounter it, you know? That was helpful to me. The downside was I got out of prison after being in that unit for about a year. So while we did have some freedoms, we were locked down most of the time. That's kind of just how Lansing is behind the walls. You're in your cell a lot unless you're skating. Skating means being somewhere you ain't supposed to be at a time you ain't supposed to be there. But we were in the cells a lot. And there wasn't a lot of interaction with other people, you know, outside of the programs and stuff. It definitely is transitional going from segregation where you have no contact with people to gen pop where you have all sorts of contact with people. True was somewhere between those, those two stages or environments, I should say. But I would leave prison from True Unit. And I had money on my books to get a deposit on an apartment and pay my first month's rent and all that stuff. But the unit teams wouldn't help me contact anybody on the streets and get an apartment lined up. And I had no way to get addresses or anything. You know, it's not like you can just hop on Google when you're in prison. It just doesn't work that way. You know, not unless you have a, a black market cell phone which I didn't because I didn't want to get more time. They were around in Lansing. I could have got one, but I didn't want to tack more time onto my sentence. I even eventually got some good time given back due to the programs that I was participating in, you know, taking part in the music program and teaching guys and doing really positive stuff. My, uh, my therapist went to bat for me, went to the unit team and said, hey, man, why don't you give this guy some of his good time back? So I got out a little bit early. But like I said, reentry wouldn't help me. Reentry is a department within the prison that's supposed to help you get set up and established on the streets before you get out. That way you can just move into a spot. I wasn't eligible to go to a halfway house. I had no prior record aside from the charge that I was in prison for. I didn't have a history of drugs and alcohol, so I wasn't eligible for any of those programs that would put me in a halfway house, and I had more than $500 on my books, so I didn't meet the criteria to go to a halfway house or get help. Furthermore, all the halfway houses in Kansas are run by Christian organizations, and some of them are kind of shady. To be honest, I don't think much of some of the folks that run those houses I'm not hating on people's religion. There are Christians out there that are very, very sincere in their faith. And then you have Christians or people who pretend to be Christians for the sake of getting a lot of money from people. And that's the vibe that I got from some of these folks. I'm not saying that's how they were, but I'd met them before. They'd been involved with the JCs and stuff. And they gave me that vibe that they were into Christianity for the money, you know, and, and I didn't want any part of that. I didn't want someone to be responsible for my living conditions when they were kind of shady. I didn't like that. I didn't have any place I could go. They ended up approving me to go to my mother's house, but it was, I didn't find out about that until right before I left prison. And at one point, my therapist was getting so upset that reentry wasn't helping me or anything like that. We went over to the reentry department and spoke to the head of reentry. And he's like, what's up? What do you, what do you want? And I'm like, well, I have money for an apartment. Could you give me a list of numbers I could call or something like that in the Kansas City area or the Wichita area? I want to go someplace where there's a lot of job opportunities, so a city would be ideal. I have the money to, to get an apartment and get transportation and all that stuff, but I need a list of places that I can go, places I can call, 
you know, so I can get something lined up. And he said, no, that's not, that's not our responsibility. And I was kind of dumbfounded. You know, I looked at him and I'm like, what do you mean? It's not your responsibility. Your reentry, right? And he said, yeah. I'm like, what is your job? Your job is to help people reintegrate into society, right? And he's like, well, yeah. I'm like, but I need help reintegrating into society. And you just told me that's not your, your responsibility. He said, that's right. I'm like, so your, your job is just a facade. It's a lie. This dude looks right at me. He doesn't get mad, doesn't raise his voice. He just looks at me. He's like, that would be a fair assessment. So is there anything else you need? And I just kind of shook my head and chuckled to myself and I left. I didn't know what to do at that point. And as I left the reentry building, which was in the programs area, I think. Anyway, I'm leaving the reentry building and I see the, the warden, Sam Klein, in the street. That's what we call the, well, they literally look like streets in the prison. But anyway, I see Sam Klein. He's the warden. He was at the concert that I performed at. He came up to me after the show and said, hey, you know, I never really understood metal before. My son's into metal and I never really understood it until I, I saw you play it live. Now I get it. So I thought I had a rapport with this guy based on music, but I was you know, full of myself. I walked up to him and I'm like, Hey man, I'm getting out of prison and I have no place to go. And reentry said they, they won't help me. What can I do here? And he said, well, that's not my problem. I'm like, are you serious? I've been down for 11 years now. I came down when I was 17. I don't know anything about the free world. And you guys keep telling me it's not your problem. And he said, yeah, you're a bright young man. You'll figure it out. And he walked off. So it came time for me to leave. And the night before, it was crazy. I didn't expect anyone to know I was leaving. Because when you're getting out, you don't really go around and tell people that. If you've got 20 years to do, 30 years to do something like that, you don't want to hear some dude walking around like, oh, I'm getting out tomorrow. So I didn't say nothing about it. But JR went around telling people, you know, oh, yeah, he's getting out. Usually you don't want people to know about that because, you know, they kind of get in their feelings. But that night, I'm walking back from showers, getting ready to lock down. And everybody on the run in B Cell House on that side is three tiers up. Everybody on that side remembered me from the concerts. And they all were just yelling out the bars like, hey, man, you know, hit don't don't forget about us. You know, hit us up when you get out. Come back in. Play music for us again. Don't forget about us when you're famous. Of course, I'm not good enough to be famous, but, you know. It made me feel good. You know, I had all these people that, you know, a lot of them I didn't even know well. I'd seen them around, you know. But they were all wishing me well, and they were all kind of cheering me on, you know. It was really cool. It was really cool. And then the next day I got out, and I guess I'll talk about that in the next video. So stay tuned for that. This has been another episode of From Prison to the Streets. I'm Eric. I will see you all later.